Hi, folks. We're having a good day today. Let me be the first welcome you to Autism Rocks and Rolls. Now, before we begin, I must note that I am not a doctor or psychiatrist. If you're starting to you diagnose with autism, please see a physician. I will be based on my experiences. As to own the right to the intro natural, they are found on ytmp3.org and archive.org. I also have a mission today like to review, review with all of you. The mission of Autism Rocks and Rolls is to take the negative stigma off of, off of autism and other conditions that may think are disabilities. People on the spectrum are not broken and do not need to be fixed. Those who have conditions or abilities not to be pitied, there's nothing to be sorry about. I also have some paid for the following. As we get closer to the Autism Farm Day on September 24th, more and more people are wanting to help out and sponsor. In brief, they are as follows. Hands in Autism, Ariel Stingamabobs, Guthrie's Creek Butchery, Main Street, Shields Racing, Benny Flynn, Commercial Service, Odin Meat Store, Safeguard in Bloomington, Indiana, and Resource for Autism. Thanks to all of you for your assistance. Is, there's a good reason to re-recognize Owensburg Auto. It, the, its owner, Philip May, an auto collision and towing company, specializes in collision repair. They currently offer paintless dent repair, PDR, for hail damage, door dings, light creases, and dents. At Owensburg Auto, you can pick from 10 different colors of Rhino Pro Tough Coat Bend Liners, paint machinery, equipment, which are you need painted at Owensburg Auto. And Stone Belt provides support and resources resources to its differently abled people. Founded in 1958, it is the largest and oldest agency of its kind in the South Central Indiana. The services offered by Stone Belt go beyond customer services. Thanks to its efforts, many lives have been changed. It is great. There is a great ABA center in Indiana called Peace by Peace. Peace by Peace is a locally owned, operated family business that values each child and family. Utilizing evidence-based practices and applied behavior analysis, we empower parents and help young children achieve their full potential. It operates in Monticello, Fort Wayne, Lebanon, Lafayette, Crawfordsville, and Cloverdale, and Frankfort, among the other locations. You can sign up on their website or call your location to learn more. The experience will be unforgettable. We now need to visit Bedford, Kentucky and talk about farm CBD oil. They are a family-run business that combines strengths in agriculture, pharmacy, chemistry, quality, and engineering to provide superior CBD oil. They strive to exceed expectations in the hemp industry. Farm CBD puts quality first. Also, Guthrie's Creek but Butchery needs to be heard. Guthrie Creek is a small farming, family-owned, and operated business located in Bedford, Indiana. Our team is made up of lifelong friends and family. As we carry on the dying art of the old-fashioned butchery, we want to know you can buy with confidence. And I must mention Safeguard in Bloomington, Indiana. Located on Cookboard Avenue, they can help you with any business promotional items or safety items. Safeguard is the place to shop for supplies if you are thinking about starting a business. And I at last need to discuss my nearby Kona in Bloomington, Indiana. The Kona in Bloomington is the best since you... Never leave disheartening. The promotion doesn't dishearten in the light of the fact that they serve great shaved ice. They are presently beginning to serve fall flavors like apple juice and pumpkin pie. On the off chance that you see them, make it a point to either get a freezy treat or even wave. And there are some people I'd like to thank. First, I want to thank the Green County Daily World for putting me on the front page again. I was getting publicity for the Art Autism Farm Day and Special Needs Night with the Fowlers. Thank you, Patty. We always appreciate you. And speaking of the Autism Farm Day, we need to thank Jack, Jackie Hudson Vest because she donated three bags worth of stuffed animals for prizes. We thank you so much for your donation. I also went to two tea time events with my friend, Jack Mason Good on C203, playing around with Jack Mason Golf, more information. But what a fun time. I soaked in some new information and met some amazing new people. Thank you, Jack, for letting me come the past two times. I always enjoy hanging with you and your people. I did another speaking gig too. I got to speak to Jeff Atkins about his team at IRMS, where some of his employees are on the autism spectrum. Thank you to all who took their time for me and to Jeff. Thanks for letting me do this. I had a blast. Also at the Autism Farm Day, there'll be Jeep rides, but we need some, we need some advice. We talked to a person through Jeep, through heaps of Jeeps Club, and thank you for the advice. And to Steve, thank you so much for playing it out. And the highlight of last week was a volunteer fair ARAR did through Indiana University. Last Thursday, ARAR participated in the IU Volunteer Fair, where students could sign up to help out 
We had over 100 sign up, but there are four we know who are in. They are Natalie Page, Isabel Martinez, Zoe Barnes' father, and Cadell Costello. Thank you all for believing in the mission and hearing us out. While at the volunteer fair, I also met Cry of the Children Incorporated. Cry of the Children seeks to help youth obtain the tools they need to build and maintain successful relationships with parents with parents, teachers, and a larger community of Bloomington, Monroe County, Indiana. ARAR and Myers the Work You Do have felt like it needed to be talked about. And since the last episode, I've been on two podcasts. I was on the Hardy Mom podcast with Jen Hardy and the Limitless Land podcast with Simon Caruso. These are great podcasts. Be sure to check them out. Now, folks, we'll be right back. We're going to hear an ad from the bar on Maryland Ridge. So let's get to it. There is a hidden gem in eastern Greene County, folks. Fowler's Pumpkin Patch and the Barn on Maryland Ridge Wedding Barn. Autism Rocks and Rolls is very proud to tell you about our friends, Perry and Renee Fowler, and their place of business. Both Fowler Pumpkin Patch and the Barn on Maryland Ridge is a relaxing drive approximately 15 minutes from the heart of Bloomington, Indiana, and an hour south of Indianapolis. You can find them at 5347 South Greene County Line Road, Bloomington, Indiana, 47403. The property has numerous picture locations including several rolling fields, antique tractors, red and rustic barns, trees, and much more. Customized wedding packages are offered on their website. The surrounding area also provides several hotels in which to have your guests stay for your destination wedding. Also, Fowler's Pumpkin Patch is a family-owned and operated seasonal pumpkin patch. It's the perfect place to take your family for some fall fun. Enjoy picking out pumpkins, hay rides, a corn maze, and a petting zoo. Call the Fowlers today at 812-327-4895 or 812 Two five sixty twenty two. All right, folks, we're back. Don't you be? And when you hear the words, I you'll definitely hear the words I do at this wedding barn. Now today I have not two, not one. I'm going to restart that. Today, I, today I have not one, not two, not three, but four people who I met at the one in forty four summit I presented at and at a pro wrestling show. First, we have Jeffrey Snyder. Mister Mr. Snyder was born on March 27, nineteen eighty nine in Providence, Rhode Island, but now lives in Seekonok, Massachusetts. Jeff was diagnosed with autism in 1990. He has since achieved numerous success in education, long-term employment, and independent living. Like me, he is a motivational speaker who has also done many speaking and panel engagements. That is not all because I am also joined by Ron Sanderson. Ron is an autism advocate who works full-time in the medical field. He is also a professor a theology at the Dent at Destiny School of Ministry and is a member of the Autism Society Faith Initiative and the Arts of Autism Board of Directors. Mr. Sanderson is also an author as he is the proud owner of the book A Parent's Guide to Autism, Practical Advice and Biblical Wisdom. Mr. Sanderson has memorized over 100,000 verses, including 22 entire New Testament books and over 5,000 quotations. Like Jeff, he is also a speaker and speaks at over 70 events a year on autism, including plus 20 educational conferences. We also have the ring wizard, Sage Phillips, too. He is a professional wrestler based in Bloomington, Indiana, and discussed the match he had to wrestle with outside of the ring, and that would be his Asperger's syndrome. And diagnosed at a young age, professional wrestling helped guide Sega in, in the direction that helped him learn to cope with social cues, as well as learn more about himself and deal with the spectrum of autism. Finally, we have Summit wrestler T. Ice arriving on the show, or Ty Ice. Born in Rushville, Indiana and weighing 246 pounds, T. Ice, T. Ty Ice was diagnosed with autism at age three and has loved wrestling since he was 10 years old. So let's give these amazing people a warm welcome to Autism Rocks and Rolls. How's everyone doing? Great, man. Great. Very good. Very nice. Very good. Thank you. All right. Great. I'm glad you guys are here. So... This is my first, so these first questions are for, for all of you. So, and you all can add in, chime in, or whatever you guys want to do. So what does having autism mean to you? So for me, having autism, it means having great gifts, but it also means having to refine those gifts and um, be able to learn how to use those gifts when uh, and to compensate for some of the areas where I'm weak. So I've had to learn using my gifts of having a great memory, being a great track runner. I've had to use those gifts to help me compensate in the area of where I had social deficits growing up. 
No, it sounds right on point with everything. Um, having autism is a gift and it, it helps um, for me personally, helps me focus on the aspects of the, what I enjoy in life greatly, but also keeps me in mind of like, oh, I need to be aware of what other people like in their lives as well. So with me being able to like, for example, professional wrestling, I've been able to channel the outlet and be able to take care of out, things outside of my um, professional career. I'm like, oh, I, I got to be in shape to be a wrestler. I got to eat healthy to be a wrestler. I do all these things to take care of myself. And it has helped me socially be able to talk to people in that aspect as well. Right. And it's definitely hard because not anyone thinks the same. And when that happens, it's sometimes, I'm not saying it's not beautiful because I think everyone has a purpose, but I think at points, let's be honest, it can be a true pain. Yeah, absolutely. For, for sure. Especially I, for me at a young age, it was harder for me to just understand what social cue was. And for me, like before wrestling, it was dinosaurs for me. So all my hopes was like, oh, let's, you want to know about this dinosaur and this dinosaur. And when somebody would bring something else new to the table, they'd be like, oh, I don't want to talk about this right now. I was like, okay, we'll still keep talking about this anyway. So it's understanding like, oh, it's okay to know other things outside of that aspect. Yeah, you're like, I'm talking about it. Deal with it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now, what were your initial thoughts when you learned that you had autism? Well, my, my story about um, when I was first diagnosed with, um, I actually was diagnosed with autism at 21 months old in um, December of 1990, but I didn't know I had autism until uh, 1998 when Nick News came to my house and they interviewed me. Um, they were doing a segment on autism um, and they interviewed me. They you know, filmed me doing what I would normally do. And it was that moment that I discovered that I had a special gift. And, and ever since then, I've, you know, used that gift in more ways than one. And, and it helped me become the person I am today. And, and that's one thing, you know, sometimes, you know, we all learn about our autism or neurodiverse or neurodiverse um, condition in more ways than one. But the, the key here is to accept it for what it is. And who knows, you may find, you may find something uh, in, in the most unlikely of places. All right, may, may I ask though, what do you mean by accept it for what it is? Well, I mean, uh, for, for what, well, because um, sometimes, you know, some people will view autism as like a, as like a more of a curse than a blessing. It's important to focus on the blessing aspect of autism because Sure, you know, we may not do everything that, you know, we so want to do, but as long as, you know, we're sharing our gift with the world, that's really all that matters. Yeah, and I agree with that, because let's be honest, no one's perfect, man. I mean, we all have our flaws, and I think it's a better reason, not a better reason, a better chance if we share our, with share our flaws in a sense and but also share our gifts and focus on the good parts to where maybe the negative part doesn't go away but where we can focus on the good parts mm -hmm. absolutely yeah so i think um when i got my diagnosis with autism it was 1982 so i was a very young child but it also helped make um sense of why i was different than everyone else most kids, when I was growing up in the 80s, they had G.I. Joe, they had He-Man and Transformers. And I had a prairie dog, which was a very unique, special interest. So it helped me understand why my brain processed information different and why I was so focused on the things that I loved. And it also helped me realize that I could use that focus in the areas that I had interest to become able to compensate for learning disabilities and other things I had to have to face along the way, including um, a speech deficit that I had from age two to age 16. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I was told through a book. I was told through um, Understanding Sam. And hence, I guess that's why my name was Sam Mitchell. Don't know, but maybe. But um, that's what I was told with was a book through a children's book. And I and the type of person likes to cut to the chase. And I'm like, okay, you're, and because I was trying to solve the puzzle and see what she was trying to tell me. Cause 
I thought, this guy's mean. I thought, so you're trying to tell me that I have this. And it was like, oh, I have autism. It was more of a, like you said, a eureka moment in a sense, where it's like, this explains why I act like this. No, that completely makes sense. I got diagnosed in first, second grade, actually. So it was 2002, 2003 for me. And for me, it was a realization, like for a lot of people, I believe, it's like, oh, I feel like I'm like everybody else, but this comes off as different to everybody else. So now I can focus on what I need to do to improve on certain things. I remember I would get like outbursts of like not understanding stuff because I felt pressure that everybody else understood simple things like, oh, if there's a math problem, I would not be able to understand what to do. So I'd be have a panic in front of the classroom. So then I was like, learn, okay, now I know I have to do this. Let me put a cue to my teachers like, hey, I'm confused. Can I step out for a second? So that way it helped me target my issues and able to move on in life growing up through that way. Well, Sage, you're not the only one confused with math. I don't, I don't have the math brain. I have the full on English brain. I feel that I was a, I was a science guy growing up. Science, and it depends on what the science was. If it for was sure. some like biology, I, it was survivable for me. You uh -huh. put me in chemistry. No. Right. Yeah, chemistry is a small batch of people that enjoy that for sure. Yeah, that's a, But hey, they got, they got balance on their own. Mm -hmm. Now, and what is? Now, how do you think our brains operate? Well, I mean, um, our brains, you know, it, it's like, you know, one thing that one thing that I've come to accept with, you know, my autism is that my brain is wired different is, you know, wired uh, differently in, in the way that um, that it's not like all the others, you know, we tend to think we, we think more um, within our own imaginations. And, and unfortunately, I think one, some of the things that, you know, society as a whole doesn't understand about us is that just because we're wired differently, it doesn't mean that we can, you know, we can't do the things that other people normally would, where, where, which is like, you know, you know, get a job, go to college, um, get an apartment, um, get a car, um, you know, all those things, because, you know, just because we're wired differently doesn't mean that we can accomplish any of those goals. I mean, we can do that. I mean, take a look at me, for example, like when I graduated from high school in 2007, I became the first student with autism to complete pre-K through grade 12 without coming from other towns or school districts. And I kind of set the bar for, for stu students who are wired differently, who, who are, you know, wired differently, have a different way of thinking to kind of, you know, to kind of, you know, set that, to kind of, you know, follow my lead. And it's been like that in the 15 years since I've graduated. Right. And I agree with you. And this is my personal opinion. And I'm not trying to like bash the doctors because what they did for us was phenomenal as a family, but they treat it sometimes like bad news because when they go tell them that they're diagnosed with autism, it's kind of saying in a sense, they don't say it to you directly, but they say, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. He won't graduate. He'll be able to cook. My question is, okay, that might be true, but why are you thinking that? Why are the doctors trying to go in with the bad with it as a bad message? I was going to say being wired different for me, it's been a blessing, but it also encourages me to learn how my brain works. So when I was in high school, I took Spanish, and when I took Spanish, I got a D in it. I was unable to pass that class. And the reason I was unable to pass the class is they taught phonetically. Then I took Koine Greek, which is a Greek of the New Testament, and I was able to take three years of it, get a 4.0, perfect A for all four or all three years of it, and I've been teaching it for 20 years. But here's the difference. Koine Greek is a dead language, so you can't learn it phonetically. You can only learn it visually. So knowing what I'm able to do with my way my brain works, I can learn visually, but I can't learn things phonetically. Then I can focus in on the things I can do and become an expert in them. And I've gone on to translate two thirds of New Testament from Greek into English and even make my own New Testament version of the Greek. 
in the oh. English. So yeah, knowing but... the brain is oh, important. Go ahead. I thought you were done. My bad. Um, my question though is, what do you mean by phonetically? So if I hear something, I'm not able to distinguish if I hear a sound like ba or bor. So when I hear something in Spanish, my brain's unable to process it. No matter how many times I hear it, my brain's unable to learn phonetically by hearing things. I can only learn things visually. And Temple Grandin says 80% of people with autism are visual learners. And she says only about four to 5% of people with autism can learn things phonetically. So foreign languages for a lot of people with autism is very difficult. Where dead language, you can't teach phonetically because we don't know how the words sound because it's not used today. So a live language would be like Spanish. You go to Mexico, you go to Spain, they're speaking it. With Koine Greek, you can't go anywhere in the world where they speak it because it's not a spoken language anymore. It was only spoken in the first century. So they right. have to teach it visually. Right, 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 right. And may I ask, is there a way that they could do it through, I'm not saying that they could, I'm just saying, is there a way they could? Or what would have helped you in that Spanish class if you had to take it again? So I think it would have helped if they um, had note cards and then, um, but my brain too, the way it works, I wouldn't be able to pronounce the words because I still have some speech deficits, even though I've been in, was in speech therapy from age two to age 16. So I think having that speech deficit with English made it harder for a living language like Spanish. So oh, I, think I see that, where you're going. Okay. So, I, so sometimes you have to have an accommodation where they say, well, you know, you can't learn, uh, um, spoken language so we'll have you learn a dead language where it's visual learning and there's people too out there who could learn phonetically spanish but if they took greek they wouldn't be able to pass pass it because they're not a visual learner right i get so i get the you're other going way now. too with even typical people right now what is the most rewarding and most difficult thing about having autism most rewarding, I would say it helped for me personally find my passion. I was definitely into um, animals, dinosaurs, all that. And I wanted to go into that field after I graduated high school. But when I found professional wrestling, for me, it was like, oh, what is this world? And it helped me personally be able to be more social going to events. It helped me, oh, I want to take better care of my body. When I was a kid, I was eating uh, Jack's pizza and bags of chips, playing video games, drinking three to four cans of soda a day, uh, just gaming and not having a purpose to me finding fresh wrestling. Like, oh, I'm going to do amateur wrestling to get myself in shape. I'm going to watch my diet. And now it translated to my adult life. I just got a meal prepping before this podcast. Uh, I make sure I'm drinking plenty of water. I went to the gym. I'm taking care of myself physically because of professional wrestling. So I'm thankful for my autism that it helped me find the passion I want to focus on and help take care of my overall well-being. Okay, I could I could see that and I feel the same way. I think having autism makes you find your passion. If you think about it, I I had an episode see 205 finding the blueprint. Mm -hmm. I was talking about practicing for our future skills and that's what it sounded like you were doing basically throughout your whole entire life because you want to be dinosaur and that's all you talked about you we've stated yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked about animals and dinosaurs, but to me, that didn't translate to a social aspect. But when my autism fixed to professional wrestling, this is more um, layers of stuff. So it's physical. So I could do a uh, weightlifting class. I could do amateur wrestling. So it could translate to those people. And then also it involves a lot of talking. My senior year, I remember I did theater for the first time and my family, my uh, special ed teacher never thought I would do theater, but I was able to do theater and play one of the lead roles, which was to them was a huge accomplishment and a huge accomplishment for myself as well. Yeah, but I'm just thinking, what if, let's just think about your life. You didn't know about professional wrestling. You probably, man, would have been probably one of the greatest dinosaur people, or I don't know what to call them, but like dinosaur yeah, yeah, pathologist. Yeah. Thank you. Probably one of the greatest pathologists out there. I could potentially, it could, it depends. It's amazing what route your brain will want to go through just where you're wanting to go direction in life. And to me, it's like, I want to go this path instead. And so it's where it got me to where I'm at now. Yeah. And just because I'm not saying shifting your career was bad. I'm just thinking, what if we went route B? 
No, absolutely. And I do think about that at times, like what, what have I done? What I've been able to travel the country, d- digging up dinosaur bones, would I be touring uh, museums, giving my facts to people? Like it could have been different, wor- different world, but I'm thankful for the direction I've gone in life right now. Oh yeah. Now, what advice would you give to someone who just learned they had autism? I give them this advice, never give up, find out what your strengths are and make those strengths stronger. With autism, you're gonna have valleys of weaknesses, but you're gonna have mountains of strengths. And if you can hit those mountains of strengths high enough, you're gonna be able to compensate for those valleys. And I put it this way is we all have different gifts. So my gift is communication. I get a check every um, two weeks working in a hospital doing communication. And I use that check to make up for my limitation in handiwork. So when I need an oil change, I take the money I get from working at the hospital for my speaking engagements and I pay for an oil change. So learn how to make your strength stronger and then you'll be able to compensate for your weaknesses. I like that a lot, man, because that's personal to me. Uh, I, I, this is my strength right here with the podcast. I think it makes up for me not getting, being able to drive a car. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, my, my, um, my advice to someone uh, who recently was diagnosed is that you've, you've discovered an identity, you discovered a part of yourself that you don't even know you had in the beginning. And we are seeing this a lot as more and more uh, people later in life end up getting diagnosed. Um, And I, I think it's, and one thing I, one thing I also will say is that don't let the, let your autism get you down. I mean, you know, just because, you know, you're wired differently, you are, you are who you are and, and the goal, and you can, you can accomplish anything as long as you put your mind to it. And, and, and of course, you know, and, and just because you're, and also, you can also be an inspiration to others. Like, you know, all, all of us here on this podcast are, are an inspiration to people. You know, we do what we do. You know, we share our unique gifts with the world and we inspire, you know, people that have autism, that are, have autism and don't even know who to turn to. So I, I think, you know, we, we turn, we, you, you know, we have them turn to us. And in that regard, we, we can help them. We, we can help people be a little more comfortable about, about autism. Right. Here's, here's my question for you. I'm going to ask you kind of a question. Do you think, I don't want to say there's like limitations because autism rights for doesn't believe that, but do you think it has to be within reason, for example? I would say probably, you know, within reason, uh, I'm, I'm not really, you know, I'm not really sure about that, but, um, but I think, um, but again, it's just, you know, living, you know, just trying to live your best life as you possibly can be, you know, be living, you know, you can, you know, you can, you know, just because autism, you know, it doesn't define who we are, you know, our, we need, we need to um, get people to, we need, we need to share the message that autism is, again, a blessing more than a curse. And, and, and that's really all that really matters. Uh, you're right. You're hundred percent right, buddy. Now these questions are actually just for Snyder and Sanderson. So I got met you guys at the four, one in 44 summit. So how did you get the opportunity to present at the one in 44 summit? Um, well, I was, well, I was in contact with, um, uh, S- with, uh, Sarah Bradford, who, as you know, was, was the host of the, uh, of the conference and, I was interviewed for her podcast um, sometime uh, last year, and um, and I had a presentation called "The Man Behind the Curtain" that has become my um, my signature presentation about being neurodiverse and being in the work and getting a job. So that's been kind of you know that's my you know so I had the opportunity to um, present at that to present it at the at the event. And, uh, and, and I've, uh, and also, um, and also I was, and oh, by the way, also, if you're interested, um, 
Ron and I contributed to a book called This is Autism that is on uh, Amazon.com from 1997. And if you would like one of us to sign you a copy at a future in-person event, just let one of us know. We'll, we'll so do. I got on the show. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I, I end up getting on oh, the we'll show. Yeah. <laughs> so I end up getting on the show the same way he did. Is um, I was on Sarah's podcast, and then also one of the things I do is all my presentations end up coming from chapters of my book. So I'll pick a topic that I'm going to write a book on. So my latest book that I just finished writing my fourth book is on autism growth and transitioning to adulthood so that's where I presented uh, at the one in 44 and then I'm currently working on my fifth book on purpose-driven mental health and one of the other topics I spoke on one in 44 is on um, mental health and autism so I try and use my writing and my speaking and combine them so I speak at about 70 events a year 25 conferences a year and that gets me knowing almost everyone who's on the autism circuit and being able to present with them i'm presenting with temple grandin in october of this year oh well that's first of all congratulations on that my man and second i agree and i gotta ask isn't sj childs amazing or as we call her sarah bradford oh yeah yeah absolutely she is. I know her personally. I think you probably do too, but she's awesome. She's definitely is doing a lot for the autism community. And she definitely is very, what's the word I'm looking for? Tenacious, like a go-getter. And I admire mm -hmm. that in her. Now, my next question is, did you guys get to see, if you didn't, it's cool, but did you guys get to see my presentation? It was the Scooby-Doo one. And if you did, what'd you think of it? Um, I actually didn't get a chance to um, to um, see her presentation live, but you know she um, she um, saved the recordings for um, for for I guess till the end of the month. So so I'll get a chance to um, check that out. And uh, and uh, Sam, I don't know if you'd be interested, but I'm also I recently completed two um, Scooby Doo fan fictions that I I don't know if you might be interested in reading. I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah. Just send them to me on Messenger yeah, and I'll called, look at them. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm 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 a I'm I am i am i am i do not like read a lot, but I definitely read here and there. So yeah, I'll check her out, brother. Yep. Now these questions are for the wrestlers in the house. So how'd you all get to become a professional wrestler? Well, for me, um I found wrestling just slipping through channels. Uh, I went through, it was 2007, um, I was sleeping through and found Spike TV, and I found TNA Wrestling, and the first match I ever saw was Abyss versus Christian Cage. Uh, Christian Cage is now in AEW, which is like the second biggest company going today. Um, Abyss is, I believe, a writer for WWE now, and then I saw Abyss was a big 300-pound, six-foot dude with a mask over his face, like, whoa, what is this? So I got into watching wrestling through there. And then I watched every Thursday and then I found out about WWE and the first Raw of 2008. So I, as a fan, I kept watching those shows. I remember going to going early to school, get on the computer and looking up Wikipedia, like everything about like the titles, the wrestlers, where they got trained, history like that. And then uh, I found independent wrestling through um, Pro Wrestling Gorilla had their DVD release through Best Buy. And they had people like CM Punk, uh, Christopher Daniels, uh, Samoa Joe, people that were in WWE and TNA at the time. And independent wrestling is like the any rock band for those that are not unfamiliar with wrestling, like the small town indie shows um, that you see in more intimate venues like uh, gyms, bingo halls, it's places like that. And then through there, I found a local show uh, where Ring of Honor held up in Indianapolis. And then through there, they had another promotion called Insanity Pro Wrestling promote their event um, through, um, through the event. And then I was going to those shows every month, seeing the people. And I eventually met my trainer at those shows. And by the time I graduated college, uh, that trainer was still training at the time. And I went and got trained for 10 months. And I had my first match October 4th of 2015. 
So I've been wrestling almost kind of seven years now at this point. That's awesome, man. Do you think we're going to get to see you in WWE soon or? Oh, that's the goal. WWE, AEW. I'd love to go to Japan, Mexico, travel all over the world right now. I've gotten, thankfully, I've been very thankful I've gotten to wrestle all over most of the country right now. I just wrestled in Kansas City, Missouri for the first time a couple weekends ago. I wrestled in the East Coast, I wrestled in the South. I wrestled um, up North in uh, Massachusetts before. So yeah, that's the goal. Just try and travel internationally and eventually get signed to a contract. Uh, for me, I, uh, I, like I said, the first match I watched was back in 2009. And back then, I really didn't think anything of it. And a couple of years later, my my mother introduced me to one of her coworkers. And her son was a huge wrestling fan. And he basically introduced me to it. And him and I basically grew huge fans of it together. He grew out of it. I didn't. Basically, for him, I would not have found wrestling thanks to him. Um, I only watched TV wrestling. Like, I only watched WWE and TNA. Um, I found independent wrestling uh, pretty close to my hometown, actually, of Rushville, Indiana. The first independent show I watched was in Carthage. And that's also where I met my original trainer. After a few, After a few events of watching his show, I talked to him. And he said, we'll look into training you. He trained me for like a, for maybe a month or two and he was going to put me in my first match and that's when COVID hit. And so I had to wait for probably a whole year and a half for that. And I originally had my first match in Madison in 2020. And yeah, I really, I haven't really done anything wrestling wise for a while. So that match did not go too well. Yeah, hey, but, but like we said earlier, you win some and you lose some. Oh, definitely, definitely. But I've I've been learning. I feel that I've been growing ever since. And right now, I'm I'm pretty proud of where I'm at right now. And uh, not a lot of people are. If they look at my win loss record, they tell me, "Dude, get a new hobby." But no, I'm I'm happy where I'm at right now. And that's all that matters is if you're happy where you are. That's the only person I need to care is your is your opinion is you only opinion that matters when it comes to that circumstance oh definitely uh, yeah now this is for you Sage so when we briefly talked you said pro wrestling helped you with your social skills so how has pro wrestling helped you with your social skills exactly so I think about this a lot in terms of I used to I had therapy through second, third grade, like in school, helping me learn how to react, talk to people like, how do you react to this? How do you react to that? I learned the best socially. Uh, I actually practice my facial expressions in a mirror like, oh, I should react sad to this or learn to be happy to this reaction. So if the wrestling I was able to it was an enormous uh, flow of energy like in ring such emphasis on like things that you need to be happy about, like, oh, the good guy winning, things you gotta be mad about, like, oh, the bad guy cheated to try and beat the good guy. And so like, oh, the excitement of a guy just did a big dive and he almost got hurt doing it, but he's okay. Like excitement's like that. So through wrestling, seeing the in-ring stuff helped me learn to channel those emotions to those, to those events. And then socially as well, I met a lot of people that I believe got me to go out of my shell and like oh it's okay to like this it's okay to like pro wrestling um for me i also learned like it's okay to like trip those things like i made social obvious social mistakes and it was like oh i shouldn't say that in front of a group of people and they would laugh it off it's like hey it's okay and feel like oh i feel i wouldn't have gotten that treatment if i was in like a regular group at school so for me it was able to learn through the trial and error of pro wrestling is to be able to translate into my personal life as well through my shoot job, like I am helping teach people in my job how to do uh, the mechanical parts of my job. And I felt like even like 10 years ago, I wouldn't be able to do that if it wasn't for professional wrestling. Oh yeah, I, I get that. And I'll be honest, pro wrestling, it's crazy because one minute you're happy and the next minute you're sad. Yeah, so absolutely. It's definitely yeah. It's a, it's a wild, wild ride. Yeah, a wild ride, babe. absolutely. But I agree, the facial expressions help me because seeing these wrestlers get happy winning the title it's like okay this is the appropriate moment to be happy yeah seeing absolutely. them getting mad because they mentioned their wife okay this is the appropriate time to get sad 
Right, right. Yeah. And it took time to understand the transitions because they do transition in time from being happy to being sad. Mm-hmm. But, but then also for me, is like the crowd is able to tell me as well, like, oh, everybody's reacting like this. I should react like this as well. Right. And the crowd is definitely a factor. I will agree with yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So about you, Tyus, how do you get to become a – oh, you already answered that. Wait a minute. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, so now this is for all of you. So how did you learn that you had autism? Was it through a book? Did your best parents come out to like, hey, you have autism or – I guess, how did you get approached that you had autism? For me, it was, I just got, I remember going to the doctor, uh, I think first grade and just them saying like, oh, I'm diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. So nothing crazy. And then from there, I was able to go, like I said, to therapy through school and be able to learn how to adjust and accept like, oh, this is what I have now. I got to learn to be able to accept my social cues for what they are. I learned mainly through my dad who has really helped me a lot to this day. He, I was just literally sitting in my room watching TV and he just eased me into it. He didn't sugarcoat or anything, which good, because I hate that. But yeah, he basically told me and he did whatever he could to help me. He took time out of his own, out of his own just to help me out. And I owe him, I owe him to this day. I was diagnosed um, in 1982. When I was diagnosed, it was only one in every 10,000 who were diagnosed with autism. Now it's one in every 44, like the net title of that conference we were at. And my parents basically just told me that I was wired different, that that's what accounted for the, my um, speech deficit that I had at the time, and that it would take more work, but I'd be able to accomplish what everyone else was able to accomplish. And I was age seven at the time. Well, um, well, um, repeating what I said earlier, um, I first learned of my autism diagnosis when uh, Nick News came over and uh, interviewed me, interviewed me, and filmed me for for a story on autism they were doing. And ever since then, um, I've you know I got that part of I've got that identity. Of myself that um, that I've used to become the person that I am today. So, yeah, but hey, I forgot to ask, who is Nick News? I we I don't think I've heard of him. Uh, Nick News is um, Nickelodeon News with um, Linda Ellerby. Back in the nineteen nineties, when I um, when I was growing up, um, Nick News was really uh, was like the last um, Nickelodeon related show on Sundays and it would be like a news segment with uh, Linda with um, Linda Ellerby and I was actually um, and I was featured um, on on the show I, I don't know who I don't know who or what got got Nick News uh, to me but I'm just glad I did what I did so right I'm glad you did it too man because hey faith has its own ways sometimes that's right now, these are for the speakers in the house. So what is the main lesson you want the audience to leave when, what's the main message when you're done with that stage? Like when you're done speaking, what is the main lesson you want the audience to take with after you're done speaking? I would I have to- with me, oh, You can go, Jeff. Oh, thanks, Ron. Um, I think the one thing I want my audience to, to learn is, is, you know, Maybe is is to have them be put in my sh- walk a mile in my shoes and then we'll talk. You know, the goal for the goal for my audience is to really get an idea of of how someone like myself on the autism spectrum can pursue my dr- can pursue my dreams. And by telling my story, you know, I can hopefully reach out to those who are struggling and saying, you know what. Um, I've been, I'm, I've been in your shoes, you know, walk a mile and, you know, you're, you're, when, when you hear me speak, you're taking a walk with me in my shoes. So that's really the mess. It's really more about walking in each other's shoes that, um, that I try to send the message across. So with me, I think um, my main message is that 
autism is can be refined, not cured, that you can refine those areas where you're struggling it and become stronger at them. I always end my presentations with a different quote. And one of my favorites that I use is this one. Any fool can see an apple on a tree, but it takes vision and dedication to see those orchard in that apple seed. And I want people, when they come away from hearing me speak, realize that people with autism have great gifts and talents, but they need those opportunities to be able to shine forth with those gifts. Okay. And those are great messages, guys. I, I like them a lot. We definitely need them, I think. Now, these are actually just for Mr. Snyder. So, Jeff, how did you get involved with the Global Autism Project and the podcast itself, Autism Knows No Borders? Well, uh, they actually reached out to me um, in in January of 2021 um, because they had, you know, they have been seeing uh, they haven't seen my my work and stuff. Um, during the pandemic, I was part of a podcast um, uh, that was hosted by a hosted by a specialist named uh, Jessica Lightwise, who is the author of "This Is Autism," and and I was and I actually became a um, I was interviewed by them, and then uh, they asked me to become a moderator for the Global Autism Projects. Um, platform, my networks platform that was founded uh, in the spring of last year. And I kept on running that until uh, until someone, until my uh, my co-moderator, um, David Sharif, who of course is a very well-known, uh, he was a well-known um, self-advocate in the community. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of um, you guys know that he had um, passed away back in April. Um, and and it was, but you know, but in reality, working at the Global Autism Project, um, you know, it gives me a chance to, you know, you know, to interact with other, other people who are just like me. We all have the same mission and the same goal. And, and you know, that's, and, and, and the goal is to, the goal of the Global, global Autism Project is to reach people on a global level. And that's what I, that's I think with the Global Autism Project, I have reached out to people um, on on a global scale. Right, and the final, and I like that. I think what I see, I've I've looked at Global Autism Project before I uh, came on here. They definitely doing some great work. But let me ask you, what would you say is like the most valuable aspect or part that Global Autism Project is doing? I would have to say probably um, we're trying to reach. They're trying to reach out to um, uh, communities that are um, that are greatly impacted, you know, in the world and stuff. Like right now, uh, they're focusing on um, Ukraine, on helping families in Ukraine with you know the with the conflict that's been going on between Ukraine and Russia. So recently, they sent people. They sent some of their people over to um, Poland, and they met Ukrainian families at the um, at the at the Ukrainian uh, Polish border, and just you know, just kind of you know, trying to help them out, you know, give them support, and uh, you know, just 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 be there for them. And and I think and, and the key the key factor is um, there's a lot of you know um, families in Ukraine, um, autistic families in Ukraine, uh, don't really have the Type of services that that we have here in the United States. So, you know, some some kids over there can be undiagnosed because the system is so poor over there. So that's that's where the Global Autism Project comes in. And I think the key factor is we need to reach, try to reach out to those families that don't have the services that we have uh, to to help people better understand autism. Yeah, may I ask, what are the steps you, what, what are the steps that Global Autism Project does to reach out to a family? Well, uh, well, we reach out um, through, through our platform. We do a lot of, um, we do um, what's known as skill, they do what's known as skill corps, 
where you go to um, their headquarters in New York and you train for, I think, like five or six days. And then you go to a various country um, that is partnered with, um, with, with Global Autism Project. And they, um, and they go to like, you know, centers and schools and just interact with, the, um, interact with uh, kids that are kids and teenagers and even young adults that are on the, um, that are on the spectrum. Wow, man, that's really awesome. And in case you want to know, what's kind of cool is next month I'll be speaking virtually for Poland. So that's kind of cool. And is there any way that you could put in a good word for me to appear on the Autism Knows No Borders podcast? I saw that and I thought, man, that'd be a good podcast for me to be on. Yes, yes, I can. Um, I can send you. Um, I can send you a, a contact. I can get you in touch with um, with with one, with the uh, chief moderator. All right. I love that, man. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, these questions are for Sanderson. So not Sanderson, I'm sorry, Sanderson. So Sanderson, you said on this, this quote in your bio, it is in special education, there's too much emphasis placed on the deficient and not enough on the strength. So my question is, what is the quote and what does that quote mean to you? So it's a quote from Temple Grandin, and, and what it means to me is that when um, I was diagnosed with autism, they told my mom I'd never read beyond the seventh grade level, never attend college, never have meaningful relationships, and never excel in sports. And my mom, being a great mom, was an art teacher, and she quit her job, became full-time Ron teacher. And what she did is she focused in on my memory ability. She focused on my ability with art and use those gifts and refine them so I was able to compensate for where my weaknesses were. But the, the school teachers always looked at what I can't do and my mom always looked at what I can't do. And I think it's important with autism is look at the things that the kids are able to do. Let the kid help pace the learning process and then they'll be able to bear much fruit in their lives with social skills and also be able to have a career right because that's what part of autism rock Rose is about is why are we looking at the the deficients why in the heck are we looking at that when there's a whole bigger bubble of talents that we have look at look at the group i have right now we i have two pro wrestlers right now who who do hard work i've seen it in person i have two motivational speakers so i just don't get why we look at the deficients when we have this bigger picture And at times it's very, would you guys agree? It's very frustrating. Yeah, I agree for sure. I feel like it's just a stigma with the name autism or Asperger syndrome. It's just like, for me, I don't even tell people that I know until like I get close with them or if I'm get personal with them, like, oh, hey, I also have this, this is why I may react. It's been a thankful in my journey that sometimes they say, like, I wouldn't even know you had that until you told me. So it's nice hearing that. But in terms of like, I've seen people, or have uh, more of a uh, disorder than I do having that struggle. I was like, Hey, like this person's smart, like help them out instead of trying to be stigma and trying to stay away from a no, like, no, this person can be valuable, can help out with everybody. Right. And it kind of reminds me, I have a friend who shall remain nameless, but how can I put this? He's very low functioning mm-hmm. and he's, he's my, one of my great friends today still, mm-hmm. but he, they, sometimes I think others look at him with sympathy and pittiness which we we don't need we he is probably what he's a nice guy he has several instruments that he and i quote unquote plays and i'll tell you he's probably one of the most lovable people you'll ever meet but they were nice to him probably i think sometimes only because of sympathy which to me is very wrong i mean we all we don't need that sympathy we we appreciate the compassion I won't mm-hmm. lie to you there, but there's no need to for penis or saying, I'm very sorry. Couldn't it mm-hmm. be like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And then let it go. Like some of your friends have probably done. And so now this was also for uh, Ron. So you seems like Temple Grant has a very big influence on you. So what does Temple Grant's influence mean to you? So it means to me is that um, we can be on the spectrum and we can 
be able to use our gifts in unique ways. And we can do things that other people aren't able to do. You look at Temple Grandin with her ability to design the slaughterhouses for cattle. You look at Temple Grandin being a professor and I see a lot of things she's doing in those same types of things I've been able to do. I've been a professor now going on 20 years. She's written massive amounts of books. I've written three books and I got a fourth book that's gonna be published. And I've published over 2000 articles on all, or I mean 200 articles on autism. So I see her as kind of a role model of the things we can accomplish. Right, and that's, it's kind of going back to what you said. There are blessings in the autism. We get to experience certain life, like life journeys, I call them, that no one else does. I mean, look at us as speakers. We've traveled, I bet, to many places. I've, tra I've traveled to Orlando, Canada, Florida. I'm not, sorry, Oklahoma. And if I was a motivational speaker, I would have never been able to go to Canada. So I think that's an experience to definitely share and I would say brag about, but tell about. Because, hey, this is because I get to go to Canada? What the heck? Because of my message. I mean, I just find that phenomenal. Now, I do want to talk to you more about Prairie Pup, Sanderson. So how did you feel when you got Prairie Pup for Christmas? So I was very excited. I got him in 1982. Um, I remember seeing him at Arts and Apples. And when I got him, it was the best Christmas present I ever had. All right. Now, you also got to meet Isaiah Tom Thomas with Prairie Pup. So how did you and Prairie Pup feel when you got to meet basketball player Isaiah Thomas? So I felt excited. I won a major art contest, the Detroit Edison poster contest. So I was excited. I since gotten to meet people like Muhammad Ali in 2002. About um, seven years ago, I got to meet Screech, Desmond Howard from Saved by a Bill before he passed on. So I've gotten to meet lots of celebrities over the years. So it feels good to meet celebrities and introduce them to Prairie Pup. When I met Curtis Armstrong, who did Booger and Revenge of Nerds, I said, can you take a picture with your finger up your nose and holding Prairie Pup? I said, I'll do better than that. I'll shove that Prairie Dog up my nose. So I got a picture of Prairie up Kurt Armstrong's nose, another celebrity. Wow. Next thing you know, I'll try to get Temple Grannon's, right? On Temple's nose. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, or she try. said she'd shoot the prairie dog because it injured her cattle when she oh. met prairie pup. Oh, crap. Never mind. They're not taking her to Temple. Yeah. Then. <laughs> and then she said she couldn't tame my honey badger because it's a badass when I met her. Fair enough. I'll give you that. So, oh, wait, a minute. you got to meet Temple? That's awesome, man. Let me, let me ask you, what, how was that experience like? Because I'm friends with her personally. So, when she met me, this is what she said to me. Do you have a job? And I said, I work in the mental health field. And she goes, good, I'll sit in and listen to your presentation. I spoke to about 200 people on autism and athletics. And she was sitting front row for about 45 minutes of my presentation. So it was kind of nerve wracking having her sit in there, but it was also exciting knowing that she got to hear my whole presentation. That's pretty cool. I, I Temple got to do the same thing with me. When I went to Canada, Temple was there as well for a book signing. She said, I'm going to go to his talk because I know him well enough. And I was like, oh, great. I mean, I wanted to please her. So I wasn't like, oh, my God, uh, like nervous, nervous. But I was like, yeah, let's hope we go well. But whew, my mother, she was like, oh, shit, because she didn't want to blow it up. Now, I got to ask you this, so, and I'm putting you on the spot here, man. So you said that you can tell every fact about a prairie dog's life, right? Yeah, almost every fact. Do it, please. Thank you. All right, so one of the most interesting things about a prairie dog, it's the only animal that understands adjectives, and adjectives are words that describe. And also, the average prairie dog has 15 miles of tunnels in its home and it makes its tunnels in such a way that oxygen is able to go in and out of the, the tunnel so it doesn't fill up with carbon dioxide and the prairie dog suffocates. So prairie dogs are great designers. They're also one of the most social animals because they understand verbs, adjectives, 
nouns, pronouns, and they're the only animal that's able to do that. So that's one of the things I like about prairie dogs. They're good at English, they're good at designing, and they make a hell of a burrow. That's, man, that's a lot. That's really impressive. I, I can tell you, that was one of my special interests I can relate is I know every main event of the WrestleManias and I figure like the wrestlers would appreciate that. So, so who was your favorite wrestler of all time? Oh, uh, wrestler of all time. Oh, you Nick Foley, man. Nick Foley. Yeah. That's my favorite right there. Got to have the sock. Let's see if you can guess who mine is. Oh yeah. Slim. Yeah. Slim. Oh, Randy Savage. Yeah. Randy Savage. You all right. It. I'll give you that. Randy Savage me. was pretty good too. I got to meet George the Animal Steel a few years ago. Oh, that was awesome. What was that experience like? It was great. It was funny because there was an autistic person in the audience, and he was naming all the dates and things that George the Animal Steel has accomplished. And I got his book autograph. I got my picture of me with my arms around his neck and him sticking out his green tongue. Do you have that picture still? Or I can't find it. It was pre cell phone days, and I took it on a one of those cameras, and then it ended up getting lost. Oh, but I still right. have the book autographed by him. I have a That's whole cool. bookshelf of all famous people, books signed by famous people I've met, like Stephen King and almost everyone under heaven. That's awesome, man. That that's awesome. I'm I'm glad you got to meet those because man. That is just, that's just, that's just cool. Let's put it that way. Awesome. And like, like lit in a sense, like just really cool. Now these are also for, well, actually, yeah, this is for Sage. So you say that quote in the bio, you had a wrestle autism. So why did you feel like you had a wrestle autism? It just turns in the fact that, like I've said before, being able to, understand how my autism worked and understand like oh like why I have this disorder and how I can be able to channel it and like I've explained through the podcast how wrestling helped me channel my autism through social cues through being able to do social events and be able to like just get out of my shell as a human being yeah and I'll think I think about it me being I'd rather be in an ankle lock than honestly trying to socialize with a big group (laughs) <laughs> that's saying something the irony in the fact that my family is like oh you can go to a wrestling show and do this in front of like 20 to a thousand people but you don't want to go up to in front and talking to everybody from your family I'm like yeah it's because it's what i like in that spectrum <laughs> i like that that's what i like and he, think about it this way that's guy mark henry says that's what i do <laughs> <laughs> exactly. in a sense but and think about it too maybe it's because and i'm not saying this is the reason like i said i'm not a doctor but I'm considering the fact that do you think it's possibly because you're distracted by what you are doing? Like because you love the wrestling so much that your like nervousness is going away and oh, wrestling like shadowing so. the nervousness. I still have nerves as a performer. I, I feel like it's good to always have nerves as a performer in terms of like you want to do well with what you do. Um, I think it just helps me channel like what I want to do and have have my goals set in mind and so that way i can lead the rest to those goals and it gives me the motivation to not shy away and like go forward instead of going backwards from them right i hear you okay that makes sense now this is for ty ice so you say stated before that ray mysterio is your favorite wrestler so why is ray mysterio your favorite wrestler and what do you like about him specifically well mainly he was my favorite wrestler because he was in the first match that I watched as a kid, which, as I told you before, was Rey Mysterio and CM Punk, straight edge CM Punk on SmackDown 2009. And mainly it was because masks were, they weren't that big of a thing as much as they are now. So masks were just pretty much like over with the crowd. And so that's mainly why I liked him. I liked his style, Luchador style. And it's kind of hard to dislike it, but. Yeah, of course I can't do that. I I don't I don't plan on doing any of that. Yeah, but, you're like yeah. you'll be like the road dog. He gets a nosebleed when he goes to the top rope, do the second rope. <laughs> yeah, I've never gone to the second rope or top rope. I currently don't plan on that because I I don't have as good a hops as I used to. Yeah, next thing or hey, you never know. You might might fall by accident. I've seen a lot of wrestlers do that these days. Definitely happens. 
Oh, yeah. Have Actually, you seen the one with Bobby Lashley lately? I think the top rope snapped. The next thing you know, he's out going out back. Right. That does happen for sure. It's But he got learned. He learned well how to catch himself, though. So that's why you run the ropes the way he does. Yeah. Actually. Fair enough. And, hey, actually, he's not the only one who done it. <laughs> now, these are for the wrestlers again. So how would you describe your wrestling style? Like, is it a lot of showboating? Is it a lot of, like, powerhouse? Is it, in your case, which is, in Sage's, in your case, what is not T.I. says so is Rey Mysterio sort of, like, or is it like uh, kind of the dirty wrestling, like the Miz, or what would you say your wrestling style is? I can do some lucha. Like I'm not to the extent of Rey Mysterio where I can do moon salts and flips, but I can do uh, arm drags. I can use the ropes to my advantage. Um, I love the technical wrestling style, like the Kurt Angle, the Davy Richards, uh, the like better of a current version Matt uh, Matt Gable. Uh, though that style is what I love so much in terms of being able to go hole for hole, and I think also it's for my. Uh, Oh, excuse me, Chad Gable. I said Matt Gable. It's Chad Gable. Uh, the, the amateur wrestling style is what I loved growing up, especially since I went through amateur wrestling and it shows like, oh, like you can physically outwork your opponent. So I focus more on that style of wrestling. And I'm also very much influenced by the European style of wrestling, which is very catch as catch can, working arm hole, working leg, working leg locks, submission, stuff like that. Uh, I got to be honest, that's not my style because after a while, I don't mind it for a little bit, but for me, it gets boring after a bit. It's like, Absolutely. okay, I've seen this. It's like, sure, okay, now also, like, if you follow the story of the mat wrestling, and, and it's why as a wrestler, you got to be able to do multiple styles. Like, I know my strengths and my weaknesses, so I know I can do some lucha. So I'll add that into my technical wrestling. Um, I won't be able to do things. I I won't try and do things that I know I can't do. So I'll make what I can do good, make it look good. For my style, uh, mainly it's just. A, it's mainly just a style that not only I can have fun with, but everyone else can have fun with. Like if you like, you watched my match at Summit against Ray and Carter, where at one point I had him in the corner, got the crowd just kind of riled up. I did a strut to the middle of the ring, and I just kind of did the old school blue meanie dance before I ran back to him. That's something that I kind of have fun doing, and it really seemed like everyone else just bought that. And yeah, that's just that's mainly what I like to do. As far as what I do in the rain, I prefer mainly to just throw strikes like punches and forearms. I'll do some powerhouse stuff here and there because I'm pretty strong, especially for my size and weight. But yeah, it's just my style. It's just something that not only I want to have fun with, but something that the crowd can have fun with and just get along with. Right. And I just think sometimes, and I'm not saying fashion rest, like professional wrestling, like the big companies again, but I think you get, a lot more of a personal experience than you do with the big shows at little. Sh I think you get more personal experience with the little at the little shows than the big shows. Absolutely. Oh, that's why it's uh, that's why the independent wrestling shows. I feel like are more, a lot more intimate. And again, to me, it's more comparison for wrestling to any rock band or a circus act in terms of like, Oh, it's very intimate. It's trying to react to that target audience right there instead of just the TV and just the TV audience. Right. And, but there are, stand, there are people in the stand. So, but, you there's a small enough people where you can almost interact with them like a family member. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas at AEWWE, you can't interact with everyone. Yeah, you can right. high five some here and there, but you can't go into like you can't go back, you can't go all, all the way in the back. Absolutely, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Now, folks, we'll be right back. We're gonna hear from Bobcat in Ellsville, Indiana. So let's get to it. Are you wanting to do construction in your life? If so, Bobcat at Ellettsville, Indiana is the place for you to work. For 60 years, Bob Curl and the other six locations have been offered as a resource to construction equipment and sales. They can provide you with Bobcat equipment, Bronkite trailers, Phil power tools, Echo Outdoor power equipment, Renmax power equipment, and Xmark commercial mowers. They also carry the products that are called Xaviators, compact track loaders, skid steer loaders, Versa handler, telescope tool carriers, all-wheel steer loaders, utility vehicles, and tool cat utility work machines, plus a wide section of attachments. Be sure to use their services and give them a call at 800-825-9132. All right, folks, we're right back. And yes, if you check out, you, you may, you never know, you might find some bobcats. Now, th this question is for you, Sanderson. So you said you're a professor of theology. So what got you into theology? So what got me into theology is my 
junior year of high school, I got really active in church and um, I enjoyed reading the Bible. I enjoyed studying the Bible. So I decided I wanted to go to Old Roberts University and get my degree in theology. And I, my senior year, I flew out to ORU, checked it out, and I knew that's where I wanted to be. And then my sophomore year of college, I began attending ORU and I went there for six years and got my Master of Divinity from there. And then I got my undergrad in theology and psychology from ORU. Wow, that's awesome, man. And you said you got into like the church. So what about the preaching and the ministry did you like? Was it the fact just his voice? Was it the fact that his passion? What was it? So I speak currently about 25 churches a year. I'm speaking this Sunday on autism at a church um, in Lansing, Michigan. And the next day I'll be speaking at a Sunday service in Troy, Michigan. So I really enjoy being able to share God's word, the gospel. And um, I enjoy too, because then it gets me on the road traveling to all these different places. The biggest church I ever got to speak was Rob Parsley's church in Columbus, Ohio. I got to speak to 6,500 people on autism. And everyone here knows someone on the spectrum or they have a family member on the spectrum. So it's really helped me out with speaking at churches being able to share the message on autism and also share the gospel in the love of Christ. Right. And that's awesome. man. I'm glad that you're like bringing a bit of yourself within your mission. I'm, I'm really glad about that. Now, these questions are for you, Jeff. So you said you're an avid fan of Disney. So what do you love so much about Disney? Well, I've always been a big Disney fan uh, growing up as a um, uh, growing up. And um, and one thing I've noticed as I've gotten older is that that there's traits of autism in Disney characters. And I actually did create um, a two part presentation called Autism and Disney Characters that showcases various characters that demonstrate traits of autism that we, the audience, may not see. Like um, some examples include um, like Dopey from Snow White is nonverbal or um, Winnie the Pooh, who, um, you know, doesn't have a lack of, um, who has a lack of awareness around him. And then uh, and then you also have um, a Tigger who doesn't understand personal boundaries. So all these, all these, these are just a few examples of the characters that I, that I think um, display traits of, um, display traits of autism that we may not even realize. And, and that's something that, you know, I've, you know, looked to, you know, hopefully, hopefully present and at some point in the future, some more. Yeah. I, I, when I, I, cause you posted it, I saw your website. I, I agree with every sense of it. And I didn't like think about it until I read. I thought, holy crap, you're, you're right. Cinderella is kind of autism or Tigger is autism. Like, wow, I would never be able to have done that. I, that was very impressive, man. I'll like applaud you for that work. I really will. Thank you. No problem. Now, my question is though, has Disney helped you through your life? Like if you were having a bad day, were you like, man, you know what, I've had a bad day, kind of rough, just not feeling right. I'm going to go put on a Disney show. I, I would say probably yes. Um, you know, I've, you know, even though in recent years, I've, you know, turned to like classic sitcoms like Seinfeld, All in the Family, The Jeffersons, uh, Sanford and Son, uh, for like, you know, for, you know, um, for like something to turn to if I've had a rough day and stuff. But I mean, Disney, Disney um, is like, you know, this magical world that you can go into for an hour, two hours and, you know, just, just, you know, try to get your, try to melt your troubles away. So. Gotcha. I, and I, I agree a lot of, I'll tell you, it's not with me, Disney, it's Marvel. Marvel has helped me a lot as well. Lots of, lots of Marvel. Now, this question is, again, for Sanison. So you stated on your website that your honey badger moments was meltdown. So my question is, 
How did you get through your honey badger moments? So most kids are like bottle of water. They get shaken up, stirred up, not much is happening. I'm more like Mountain Dew. I get shaken up, kaboom. And one of the things that helped me was learning coping skills. One of the things that I do is I memorize massive amounts of Bible verse. I have 15,000 memorized. I always keep a few in my pocket and go over them when I'm starting to feel like I'm going to a little oozy from the environment. So I've learned coping skills that help me stay calm. And then one of the things too is that the older you get with meltdowns, the less sensitive you get to your environment. I find that exposure to massive amounts of different environments has enabled me to be able to adapt to my environment. I've been everywhere from Madagascar to Israel speaking. So I've learned about lots of different environments over the years and I've traveled to many different places. So now it takes a lot for me to reach a honey badger moment. And that's awesome that you did that. But let me ask, what can, what can others on the spectrum do from your perspective to adapt to their environment? Because you said traveling helped you. So yeah. how did you adapt so from Madagascar to Israel? The more, the more places you go and you expose yourself, the less you're going to be um, dependent on that um, environment and it's going to impact you. You're going to be able to impact your environment more. When you see Moses, he came to a rock and um, he brought a spring out. It brought water out of it. Or when he came to bitter water, he was able to make it sweet. And I think the more we get in different environments and we learn to adapt to those environments, I think it also takes knowing what your coping skill is. So some people having music helps them adapt to their environment. For others, it's having headphones when there's noises all around them and they're in the city. For some, it's lighting if they wear their sunglasses. So it's knowing what you need to adapt to your environment. And then the more environments you're exposed to, the more you're going to learn how to adapt to those environments. Okay. And I think that's very helpful, man. I think a lot of people will take that into consideration. Now, this is another one for you, Jeff, but I looked, looked at your presentation with the drills about like fire drills, school, like the school drills. So my question to you is, did you have any like panic attacks before you got the sources to help you with the drills? Or was it like where you just got the drip, like the accommodation, like the accommodations automatically? When I was in, um, when I was in uh, elementary school, when I was in school, um, it was put on my IEP that I would get taken out of the building before, like, for example, with fire drills. And then, uh, like, I would get taken out of the building before they would pull the alarm. And then, uh, and I think the key, and then also, um, I would get, like, advanced notice when it comes to, like, you know, if when we're going to do lockdown drills or you know, things of that nature. Um, so one of the, and the, the key factors of school safety drills and autism is that we have to, uh, is, that, is that schools need to be aware that while school safety drills are important, they are not, um, are, are important, you know, not, neurodiverse uh, special education students may not fully understand the concept of it and you know they may take you know you know they, they may behave in a way that may that will cause the schools to think that they're trying to get out of the drill just by acting and stuff but but the key factor of school safety drills and autism is to reach out to teachers and administrators that these are kind of these are drills that need to be taken in baby steps like you know one step at a time and that is a and and the goal is to get is to have teachers and administrators get the message so that they can you know be there for the student when they are you know trying to you know go through the process of a, of a school safety drill Right. And I agree with that 100% because it is baby steps. It's not automatically where someone, oh, tornado drill, book over the head, kids. No, nah. you got to work to get there, man. It really, it really is, as you said, baby steps. And I've experienced that myself with fire drills. I know my friend, 
he hates fire drills. It's not because he's on the spectrum, but it's because he's in a wheelchair and it's kind of hard for him to get out the door in a sense. But mm-hmm. I could I could definitely see your reasoning why it's like bother bothering. The noise doesn't bother me, but it's more like an annoying tolerance. It's like, really? Really? You gotta go that loud. Like that's my thoughts on a fire drill. Mm-hmm. So now these are for Sanderson. So you said you love track. So what got you interested in track, brother? So it was in sixth grade. I won a silver medal for track when they had athletic day in in um, middle school. So after that, I fell in love with the sport and it's been doing track ever since. And I still like to run every once in a while. I'm not as fast as I used to be. Now I can't run a 426 mile, but I can run a five under five minute mile in my forties. That's awesome, brother. Hey, I can barely run a five mile. So that's impressive already. Now, what would you say? I'm sorry. Now you also got the opportunity to talk to Craig Stanley. So what was me and Craig Stanley like? Um, he was a netter athlete who was um, over the age limit. So we were able to connect and then also have the first major Americans with disabilities case in Michigan, Sanderson versus the MHSAA. And the reason the case was named after me is because my last name came before Stanley. So it was kind of cool having someone else there um, who was also past the age limit and um, being able to um, see the rules change because of me and Craig Stanley. Yeah, that was pretty cool. I read that. That was very inspiring, man. Now, this question is for Snyder again. I looked at another presentation, and you said one of the solutions for a school dance is to find a quiet zone. My friend, I have one question for that. Where would there be a quiet zone during a school dance? And I'm not trying to like, like get like be, be critical on you. I'm just wondering, like, where would that? Where would one be? Well, I mean, uh, one one quiet zone uh, could be like out in the hallways, um, outside of like the gymnate, like like in the gymnasium, uh, you could, um, you could be out there, um, in, in like, a in like some kind of area or maybe like a, maybe the, maybe, um, maybe like the cafeteria or something just to kind of, um, just to kind of, you know, maybe take like a sensory break from the, from, from the uh, school dance and all that. And, uh, cause we really, we, we want to, you know, we want to try to, um, you know, go to these dances to just, you know, you know, be social and, you know, interactive. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of schools, a lot of students, you know, struggle with the concept of going to a school dance that are on the spectrum. So maybe it's, maybe there's a, so, you know, perhaps the best way would be to um, go to this, like designate like a certain area that the student can go to um, whether it's the main office or the um, or the cafeteria or maybe even the classroom or something like that, just to kind of um, it, it's just to give them like a sensory safety net in that regard. In that regard. Oh, okay. I didn't think of that, but I agree with you now because Eastern my school has a sensory room for those on the mm-hmm. spectrum, and it it's really it really does help and it's very beneficial. And I've heard that the kids use it a lot. Like we have, we have, we have a lot of students that are on the spectrum and I think they utilize it sometimes. Thought mm-hmm. you'd be very happy to hear that. Yeah. Now this is for all of you. So are there any stories that involve you getting bullied that you can share with us? And if so, please share it and tell us how you overcame the bullying and how you coped with it. So one time, um, when I was on the track team, a guy stole a transfer. And they put it in a Ziploc bag, and a guy dared me to take a shot put and brew up some transfer stew. And I did that. And then the guy who stole the transfer gave me a black eye. And I overcame bullying by using the gifts I had running track and being popular for um, being a great track runner. And that helped me be able to overcome bullying. 
For me, um, I remember I had issues with the person in my uh, junior high class. He was a uh, in the locker room right beside me. He always hazed me. And then after one point at the, we got done with the gym and we go in the locker room, uh, he stopped me by the door. I said, only, only man can come in through here. So he shoved me and I shoved him back, sticking up for myself. And he tried to swing at me and I got him down. And then everybody noticed uh, the fight was going on and they applauded me for standing up for myself. And then I immediately talked to the teachers like, hey, like I need to move because he's going to keep hazing me. And since then, like he left me alone and people told him to back off. It just like I stood up for myself. I feel like that in terms of like being able to not be shy and be able to stay, stand up for yourself is very important. I don't recommend fighting. That's definitely not what I'm saying, but definitely stand up for yourself in those aspects. Well, honestly, I was never bullied um, growing up, but I, um, but, but I've seen other, I've seen some of my other friends being bullied and it's, you know, unfortunate because, you know, people think that they're entitled to bully because of position or just because we're weaker than they are. But it, it's, it's something that I think, you know, does need to be um, addressed more especially in this day and age with like social media and all that sort of stuff. So that's, that's, that's just, but honestly, I, I, I was never bullied, but my, but some of my peers were, so. I can't really recall a time where I got bullied that kind of sticks out with me, but I will take a minute to say that I agree with Jeff that it needs to be addressed more, especially this day and age. I'm I'm with you, and you know what's sad, and what's really irritating me is sometimes the people who stand up for themselves get in trouble because I think today's stage, I'm not saying you're a, you're a bad person, but you'd get in trouble because you're stood up for yourself, <laughs> and that it's honestly pathetic that some schools do that. I know I've heard one school that I heard one school that the two people who fight they don't care who started it they're both expelled. And I thought, wow, that's really smart. And it makes me chuckle because of just how idiotic it is. Because shouldn't the person who through who's being antagonized have some the one the yeah, I'm trying again. The one who the shouldn't the antagonizer be suspended and not the person who's just trying to go on? I mean, it's isn't it ridiculous? I'm your opinion? I, I, I do, I think I do so. honestly say, I do honestly think that it is ridiculous that whoever the antagonizer is should be the one who's punished and not both the antagonizer and the victim. It should be, it should be at least noted who it is, who is who. Right. I agree with that 100%. And I mean, well, let me ask you guys what you think we could do to. Pre prevent the victims, in a sense, getting suspended or being wronged when they weren't? I think advocacy. My dad, whenever I, if someone picked on me, he said, um, if someone picks on you and they fight and you fight them back, I'll stand up for you. My dad always stood up for me and he wouldn't let a principal or anyone else suspend me when I got in a fight. And I think it comes down to parents and the parents are, gun ho then they can with their kid who got bullied then the the principals and then they're going to have to back down because a parent has the authority to go after that principal and get other parents involved and um put their put them in a place where they don't want to be get even the media involved if they're if the principal should choose to um, do something like that i agree Please. definitely i totally agree with you man now, this is for our speakers again. So you both say that you were nonverbal. So how did you attempt to communicate while being nonverbal? So it took me um, years of speech therapy to be able to talk like I do today. I took over 14 years of speech therapy. So that's what's helped me become a motivational speaker and a public speaker. Well, honestly, I, I 
I didn't start talking until I was four, until I was um until I was four years old. And and you know, I mean, I you know, I could only communicate through motions and making sounds and all that. So I mean, it's just uh, I mean, you just gotta. I mean, you know, it, it's very very hard to communicate, and 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 that in, in that sense, it is sometimes that. You know, I think whether you're nonverbal or verbal, it's hard to communicate. Don't you guys agree with that? Mm-hmm. And it's definitely a challenge, but I think we all done pretty well for ourselves. Absolutely. Now, folks, we right, yeah. Now, folks, we right back, but we're gonna hear an ad from Rise Autism Therapy Services. So let's get to it. Rise is a new ABA center committed to serving children and teenagers from two to sixteen in Bloomington and Evansville, Indiana. They value quality of care over anything else. That is why their BCBAs have small caseloads so that your child is a priority. We are dedicated to supporting families and our community to make an impact that is lasting. The small clinic size allows them to be available for you. They want to help make your family's life better and more enjoyable. To book a session, call them at 812-287-8561. Or if you have any questions, please email them at admin at riseautism.com. All right, folks, we're back. And yes, please check them out because they will you will definitely rise to the occasion. So my next question is for you again, Jeff. So what would so you talked about mentoring? So what would they have what would someone on the spectrum change within themselves if they want to mentor someone with autism? Like what does someone who is not autistic had to change within themselves to mentor someone or be a good mentor? I would say probably, uh, I mean, sometimes we have to change ourselves a little bit and, um, you know, because we have to kind of let some certain aspects of us go. And then we can, um, when we do let them go, then we have the, um, we have the, um, uh, then, then we can, you know, share the experiences that we can that we can share with with um, others. So, all right, and I agree with that. I totally agree because I think sometimes our stories is worth hearing because of the relationship of others of not the relationship but the relation of others. Because I think someone can emphasize with what we all went through. I mean, I can emphasize. I mean, I can't understand it. But I can relate to the bullying you guys shared earlier before the break. So definitely, totally relate, definitely relate to what you have all went through. Now, Sanderson, I want to know, man, how'd you get to be a minister? So I went to college and got a ministry degree. I worked for four years as a youth pastor right out of college. And then I it really being a minister is connections. And I made many connections with pastors and working um, in churches. And that's how I get to speak at all the different churches I speak in. It's all through connections, networking, and having a degree helps me out too. Because a lot of churches, they want you to have a degree if you're going to be a minister. And I'm working on getting ordained in the Assemblies of God churches. So then I'll be speaking a lot of Assembly of God churches in the coming year in 2023. That's awesome, man. I'm excited for you. I really am. Like, I can't, you're going to kill it, man. You are. Thanks. No problem. Now, you also mentioned your book. So, when did you decide to write your book, A Parent's Guide to Autism Practical Advice and Biblical Wisdom? So, I wanted to have a book to help parents be able to educate their children on the autism spectrum. So, what I did is each one of my books on autism. Parents' Guide begins with diagnosis and in infancy in autism and goes on to adulthood. My second book focuses in on young adults with autism, views from a spectrum of window in the life and faith in your neurodivergent child. And then my third book, Autism, Growth, and Transitioning Adulthood, which will probably change the title, Krigel, when they publish it, focuses on young adults reaching maturity. Right. And I think, and you definitely, and how did you use like religion and about in the adulthood world? And it says like, how do you use religion and mature while talking about the mature aspect of 
as a young adult in the autism spectrum in your book? So my book has um, Bible verses that share with um, things that young adults are going through who are on the autism spectrum. Like um, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I describe how people with young adults with autism can gain hope and how they can learn those social skills. So I bring in biblical texts where they apply to the situations in the chapters. Okay, that, that's, that clears it up. Thank you, man. Now, this is for Jeff. So I looked at your, I was, I stayed for your presentation and watched your, um, your behind the curtain presentation. And you talked about being like a boss and like what a good boss and a bad boss and what they can do, what they cannot do, how, how you make it feels. But I want to know from your standpoint, and I thought about asking you this during the summit by one, and, but I kind of got like ran out of time. So how can a boss find the balance for holding them accountable, but at the same time be understandable? Well, unfortunately, um, particularly in retail, there's a lot of bosses that um, that are that can be both good and you know bad because in a, what I look for in a good boss is someone that is very that shows leadership, shows you know um, you know accountability, you know who's willing to help you, and then there's others that you know are only out looking for themselves, and in in that sense, um, you know you're you're just um, you're just trying to, you know, you just, you want to impress these people, but you know, they're, they're so full, they're so full of garbage that they, that they don't even pay attention to, you know, what you're trying to do and stuff. So. Right. And I, agree, and I agree. It's just, and it's hard to find the balance sometimes too. Wouldn't you, would you agree with that statement? Y yes. Yeah. Cool. 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 Now. This is for our Sage. So your nickname, the Ring Wizard. So where did the nickname Ring Wizard come from? A uh, big fan of uh, Harry Potter. So uh, kind of the idea of like, oh, uh, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Let's do Sage Phillips uh, Ring Craft and Wizardry. So it's basically a, a play on words. And for the fact that like I am a technical wrestler and I like doing uh, mat wrestling. So it feels like, oh, I'm, I'm a wizard in the ring. Gotcha. Hey, at least they ain't call you like the ring Harry Potter or something like Harry Potter. Here comes some Harry people, Potter. Some people get get the on me with that, but with the shorter hair, I think it helps out with that. So, yeah, kind of, buddy. I don't know. What I do get more Johnny, I mean, get more Johnny Gargano than anybody else. Johnny Gargano. Okay, I agree with that. <laughs> Maybe Johnny Gargano two point oh in the house. No, I'm kidding. Basically, I've heard that before plenty of times. Yeah. Now this is another one for Sanderson. So. How'd you get to be a board member for the Autism Society Faith Initiative of the Autism Society of America and the Arts of Autism? So the way I got on that board is that in um, 2015, I got to be the keynote speaker at Ernie L's All for Autism Center. And I got that by contacting the center and telling them I'd like to come out and speak. And that I mentioned that my mother-in-law and father-in-law at the time lived near their center and I'd like to come out and speak. And they had me as a keynote speaker. And then after I was a keynote speaker, they asked me a couple years later to be on their board. And that that's awesome, man. They just loved you so much. They wanted you back, right? Yeah. That sounds, that sounds about right. Now, folks, we'll be right back. We're here to add from Unlocking the Spectrum. So let's get to it. At Unlocking the Spectrum, we are committed to making the highest quality ABA therapy accessible to all children with autism. We pride ourselves in offering fun, compassionate, and data-driven programs for individuals with autism and unparalleled support for their families. Our personalized approach means that every unique child is given just what they need to reach their maximum potential. We are so happy to support Sam in his mission of taking the stigma off of autism. You can learn more about our services and employment opportunities in both Indiana and Texas at unlockingthespectrum.com or by calling 855-INFO-UTS. That's 855-INFO-UTS. All right, folks, we're back. And yes, if you check them out, you will definitely unlock your key to success. So I would definitely consider all of you autism advocates. So my question is for all of you, how are you guys advocating for autism each day of your lives? Well, right now, uh, 
Well, um, right now I run a, um, for those of you who are listening, um, I run a website called Going the Distance, which is my um, hub for my advocacy and public speaking services. And one of the things that I use it for is to try to reach out to families and, and educators and employers that, you know, being about, you know, my story and stuff, because the more I, because that is a good platform that I use that that goes towards um, that goes towards um, goes towards organizations if they ever want me to come out and share my story and and all that. So um, so the website is um, Jeff Snyder Neurodiversity Self Advocate dot WordPress dot com and uh, and you can find all my speaking services. Uh, I do blogs two days a week and 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 more. So feel free to feel free to come on over to my website and see what I have to offer. So me, my um, website is spectruminclusion.com. I share information and resources on helping people with autism be gainfully employed. Currently in the United States, only 3% of people with autism are gainfully employed. And that's one of the things I hope to change and be able to help people on the spectrum learn the skills to be gainfully employed and learn the skills to have better relationships and be able to do everything that other people are able to do. For me personally, I do not have a website, but through my social media, through Twitter, through Instagram, through Facebook, and through my matches on YouTube and through IWTV, um, I'm wanting to show that despite my disability, I'm able to chase my dream. I want to leave that message for people that have their spectrums and their autism, like, hey, you can still chase your dream and do what you need to do to chase those goals. Uh, for me, like Sage, I don't have a website or a book or anything, but I also want to say you could still chase your dreams. And even if you can't, you could still be successful. Like outside of wrestling, I work at a factory and financially and physically, I am doing pretty decent with where I'm at. So even if you can't follow your dreams, you can still be pretty successful depending on where you go. Right. I agree with all of you. Now, I do want to talk to you about schools. And I so I just want to know, would you say for the most part that your school followed your IEPs if you received one? Oh yeah, that yeah, they certainly they certainly follow they certainly follow um they certainly followed my IEP when I um when I was in school. So I mean, they, you know, they made sure of it. And, uh, you know, one of my passions is to kind of, you know, again, that's where, you know, share my experiences of being on IEP and ensuring that, you know, that schools, you know, follow the same way that, follow the same path that I took. So, I will say uh, my school did follow my IEP as as much as they possibly could. There were times where I would probably test myself beyond my IEP just to see if I could do it. That didn't really help me a lot. But yeah, I will say everyone and everyone in the school followed IEPs as well. For my school, they followed their IEPs, and I feel like it helped me helped me out really well. And like they did their best with what they had for me. So All with right. me, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, that was that was on me. They, they filed the IEPs for me also. That's good. Now, out of curiosity, and then when you guys can answer this, so what was the most useful accommodation you think through your IEP that you got? Extended time for me. Absolutely, extended time, extended time, and uh, personal therapy with a group. All right. I would say extended time and personal therapy for me as well. I think it helped me out a lot. Um, basically, uh, giving me the opportunity to, to be taken out of the building before a uh, fire drill. All right. All right. I can agree with all of you. I think the extended time helped me tremendously because ooh, when things are time, Sam rushes and doesn't read it. Let's put it that way. Because it is very overwhelming, and I don't see anything but blurs at all, my friend, my friends. 
Now, can you tell now this is just personal and I'm just curious, but can you tell us a bit about your family and how they have supported you? Uh, for me, uh, my mom, I feel still has difficulty in terms of like understanding my autism and, and understanding why I like the things that I like. Uh, she's very traditional and I feel like she's been, a, she's been a mom her, her whole life. She had my sister when she was 15. She had me when she was 20. So for, she gave me like all the help I could get in terms of being able to, uh, have IEPs, have help in therapy, have extended times. But she still didn't really understand, like, oh, why I like professional wrestling. And I've explained to her, like, oh, this is what has helped me for everything. So she's been a support, but it's hard for me to try and relate to her on certain aspects as, as an adult. But at the same time, like, as long as she knows I'm happy and long I'm doing what I love to do, she's happy that I'm happy. I will say my parents helped me a lot, especially through school, because homework was not very good for me like I could not do anything on my own and not just not just my mother because she was a teacher my dad also taught me a really good chunk of what I know to this day and 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 even my dad can go to his old friends and they'll ask him how am I doing and he'll tell them Tice is living the dream right now and I'm happy that he could say that For me, also, my parents, they were the big supporters. My mom was an art teacher, my dad, an architect, and they worked together. Tag team, as the wrestlers would say. I would have to say my, my parents, uh, you know, they're, 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 you know, they were supportive of me. They were, you know, very passionate about, you know, making sure I got the best education. And, uh, and, you know, I have to thank him for, you know, helping me become the person I am today. You know, I mean, I would not have, you know, done what I did when I, without being in, uh, without being in education, so. Yeah, I can see where you're going with that. I mean, parents advocate for us, and I'm the same way. My family has done a lot for me, too, and I'm glad that I had the great family to do that. And I think you guys are grateful for that as well, and I'm glad that. Your family stuck it out for you. Now, folks, we're right back. We're here an ad from Great White Smoke. So let's get to it. All right, folks, we're back. And yes, you'll definitely not hear smoke on the water, but you'll hear smoke on the grill. Because, my friend, there is a fire on the grill. Now, these guys are just for fun. So have done. this is for all of you guys. So what is your paradise meal? And why is it your favorite or like your favorite food? At space, spaghetti. Pumpkin pie for me. Love pumpkin pie. It's my go-to for uh, my dessert, and I prefer over a birthday cake. I would have to say pork chops and rice. Sadly, mine is pizza. What, what, pe what pizza? Sausage, pepperoni, cheese, or supreme? Pepperoni. Pepperoni? pepperoni every day oh man i like i gotta have my sausage though i like i like sausage and pepperoni that's a killer for me i'm the meat guy i'm the carnivore as you can imagine now what is your favorite movie or tv show and why do you like it this goes um, back to this goes back to liking dinosaurs uh the Jurassic park series like Open up my imagination as a kid. Uh, my mom was always like, well, aren't these scared you? Like, no, they were cool. They're monsters that actually lived at one point in our lives. Uh, it opened up my fascination for dinosaurs. I would have to say anything Disney. And recently I started collecting classic uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer movies, uh, MGM movies. So I would say I've really been getting more into the Marvel series as of late. Like, like my family even has Disney Plus. I've been getting on that a lot more lately. Who's your favorite Marvel character? Uh, <laughs> uh, kind of hard to choose one, but if I had to choose one specifically, I would honestly have to say uh, Captain America. 
So my movie would be Goonies. I've always loved Goonies. I liked how they worked as a team to um, find the treasure and save their town. That That's awesome. My family likes Goonies too. My parents do. I, I watched a bit, but after a while, I get kind of bored with it. But it's still, it's still all right. I'm not saying it sucks, <laughs> at least. But it's definitely pretty good. Definitely good. Definitely good movies, guys. Really good movies. Now, and this is for all of you as well. So what has been your favorite vacation that you have ever taken? And why did you enjoy that vacation very much? Yellowstone Park. Oh, sorry. I would have to say Sanibel Island. I'd have to say Yellowstone Park because I got to see prairie dogs for the first time in the wild. It's hard for me to pick a certain vacation, but I always love going to zoos. So as a kid, like seeing all the different zoos uh, and different animals in this world, it's always been a cool thing to see. Kind of hard for me to pick a specific vacation as well, but I do like going to zoos and me and exotic animals, but mainly to me, I just like going to beaches with my whole family, whether it's my mom's side or my dad's side. I just enjoy just spending time out of work just seeing everyone happy i get to socialize with everyone again and those are normally the vacations i like to have all right brother you here's a here's a new vacation spot for you since you like that destin florida best probably one of the nicest places alive and probably has one of the best beaches it's definitely a spot to check out we, my family went there three times and i've loved it each time so definitely check her out I'll look into that. Yeah. Now, this is the final question. Are there any good memories that you want to tell our viewers about? If you do, why do you remember that memory the most? So before anyone answers, I'd like a, like a good memory that made you feel good inside and a funny memory that made you fall on the floor. And it could be with the wrestling, with the speaking. It could be with just with your family. Your call. The floor's open. Uh, in terms of good memory, I think the first, my go-to is when I'm having my first match after training for 10 months and then going to be able to wrestle in the ring and my, my whole family and cl close friends see me wrestle for the first time. Like it was a very validating feeling like, oh, like this is what I've been chasing for. And then it's been the start of my dream. So after that, I've been chasing my dream. And now my first match was October 4th, 2015. And now I'm up to 500 plus matches in my career. I will say one memory for me is kind of like Sage, my first match, but it was actually the first match that I was, that I officiated a first match where I was a referee. And it was again, between two, two guys that I knew very, very well. And it was even at an event where I got to meet WWE hall of famer, Jimmy Valiant, because he was, he was good friends with the promoter and yeah, is mainly just being in the rain in front of a bunch of people for the first time ever mainly it's it felt good it felt good being a referee whether i was a wrestler or not it just it just stuck out to me i would have to say going to um i would have to say going to the disney parks and uh you know and just uh you know going to the and then going to the uh you know i mean i did uh I did fan conventions for a number of years. So, you know, that that's another great memory I've had. So a good memory for me was um, going to Toys R Us as a kid and picking out a new toy. And then a funny memory was when I beat up a clown when I was in um, third grade, clown took a hat off my head and caused me to beat him up. And that was when I, when I had a meltdown. <laughs> Hey, did you get in trouble for clowning around? Then I, yeah. Well, I feel bad for him. Who did? Did you win at the end, or, or was it the clown? Yeah, won? I won in the end. Oh the clown boy, clown lost his nose. Red oh nose. boy, I bet that clown went home like in tears. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you? Do we? Do we now? Not now. We know not to put clowns around you. So that's some good news. Yeah. Yeah. Well, folks, I think that's all. Is there anything you'd like to say before we head out? Any closing remarks or anything you guys like to promote? Uh, thank you for having me. First off, um, follow all my social media. Um, Twitter, SagePhillips7. Instagram, SagePhillips underscore seven. 
I have Sage Phillips account on Facebook and hopefully I'll see our wrestling ring, ring near you. Yep, I'm, I'm also on, uh, I'm on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, my username's on uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter is go distance three five is um, going the distance three five six two on Instagram and go distance three five six two on Twitter. And with me, I speak at a lot of churches. So if you have a church out there and you'd like me to come speak, you can contact me at Sanderson S A N D I S O N four five six at hotmail dot com, and then my website is um, Spectrum Inclusion. I get about 10,000 views a month on that website. And then also my Facebook is Spectrum Inclusion. In any of those places you can reach me. I do love to come and speak at your church or speak at an event. I speak at about 70 events a year. So my calendar stays pretty full. I also have a social media. Facebook is Ty Snickles. Twitter, T underscore Y underscore Ice. All right. Well, thank you guys so much again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks.